Hello and welcome. This is Vivica Williams and you're watching Head to Head on UATV. Ukraine's Ministry of Foreign Affairs is facing a tough task today, presenting Ukraine worldwide as an active player, countering Russian hybrid war with diplomatic tools and reforming the Ukrainian diplomatic service. So to talk with us today about these tasks, we're joined in the studio by Mariana Betza, spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. Mariana, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me. So let's first talk about what's on the agenda for the ministry this year? Well, the agenda for our ministry is actually pretty clear. First of all, is combating Russian aggression. It's number one. We have to deoccupy Crimea and we have to deoccupy Donbass. Uh, this is number one. The second uh, item, uh, not in the items of priority, but it is the release of political prisoners. All political prisoners that we have in the Russian Federation itself and in the occupied Crimea. And the third is, of course, cooperation, deeper cooperation with the European Union and with NATO. We need to uh, follow up the NATO standards up to 2020 and we are able to do that and we want to become EU members in the nearest future and the member of the NATO. And so what then are the specific things that are on the, uh, the steps that are being taken to fulfill some of these massively overwhelming tasks? Indeed, these are overwhelming tasks. You're absolutely right. And I must say that in terms of Russian aggression, you could see this absolute support of our international partners with regard to the non-recognition policy of illegal and illegitimate elections in the Crimean Peninsula, which took place on 18th March. They're absolutely illegal, illegitimate, and the results are null and void. And the whole international community um, condemned them. But it's not only about condemnation, it's about a broader perspective. The, we provided uh, our European partners on Monday in Brussels, when our minister was on a visit there, the list of sanctions, the list of more than 140 persons who are involved in the organization of these so-called elections in the Crimean Peninsula. And we do hope that our European partners, including Ukraine as well, would provide sanctions against those criminals. And does this, does this list also include some of these politicians we see from fringe groups uh, across Europe who uh, went to so called be so-called observers, election observers? I cannot contemplate about the names at this at this mm -hmm. stage. Uh, deliberately, I cannot say the names, but obviously these are two separate categories. Mm -hmm. Those so-called observers, because there were no official observers right. from the OD or OEC or from the UN or from other international organizations, there were no official observers. But the politicians who came, they definitely violated Ukrainian law and international law, and they would face liability for that. But this is a separate category. More than 140 persons who were involved in organizing and uh, providing our uh, poss possibilities for, for these elections to be feasible and doable in the Crimean Peninsula. And so what is Ukraine hoping to see in some of the concrete things? Because I think that's been an issue often for the international community is how to react to this and what specific type of sanctions could be imposed and what specifically would, how would they specific, have an impact has been some of the issues. I would say that the sanctions are one of the most powerful instruments on the Russian Federation and they do work. The sanctions which were imposed by the EU partners, by the US, Canada and many other like-minded countries. These are sanctions against individual persons, against enterprises, so-called sectoral sanctions, mm -hmm. uh, freezing assets, ban of the entry. They do work within time, maybe not in a short-term perspective, but in a longer-term perspective. And obviously, we need to enhance these sanctions. And Russia does not understand the rule of law. It understands only the rule of force. It understands only the rule of sanctions. And do you see that these issues going on with Britain, with the Salisbury poisoning case, uh, do you see this maybe leading to even more uh, support from, from partners? Absolutely. The Salisbury case, I think, was a wake-up call for the West in many ways, though we are extremely grateful to our partners for their cooperation and solidarity with Ukraine, which they have expressed for the past four years. Mm -hmm. But Frankly speaking, it was only when the MH17 plane was downed and when the Salisbury poisoning happened, when it was felt sort of the inner feeling of Western partners came that it could be worse. And it's actually much worse than the Cold War. 
It's actually the Third World War. We, I mean, any person could be killed in the foreign soil, and Russia is a danger. Russia, Russia is a threat. And uh, I think we obviously understood, and especially after um, the EU summit on Monday, that Russia is a threat not only to Ukraine, not only to Europe, but to the whole international community. And we have to be very firm in addressing the threat. And what else came up on, when, on during discussions during the meeting on Monday? Well, there were different, different issues, but of course the uh, Salzburg case and Ukraine were on, on the agenda, the mm. highest on the agenda, because we do understand that it is outrageous what happened. It is outrageous that we are having elections of an, one country in the territory of another sovereign country. It is outrageous that people are being killed uh, by absolutely different uh, and prohibited chemical weapons in another country. And obviously everyone understands that we have to be much more cautious with Russia while dealing with Russia. I know that there are politicians, not at the governmental level, but there are politicians who may be much more softer in terms of Russia. But I think this is their mistake, because in, in the end, Russia plays a, as a chess player. They seek their interests where they, they find the interests, and uh, it is a gamble game for them. Unfortunately, they do not value human lives, and it is very, very regrettable. And therefore, I think this EU summit helped us to be more firm and to build up this coalition, international coalition against Russia even even further. And this is good that this has put Crimea uh, back in the, the, the limelight, as it should be. So what do you see, perhaps, with the issues with human rights on Crimea, as well as political prisoners? Well, the situation is extremely, extremely disastrous, and the recent UN report on human rights in the occupied Crimea testified to the fact that um, killings, tortures, and forced disappearances is everyday reality. And unfortunately, I'm afraid that, especially after the boycott of the Crimean Tatars and ethnic Ukrainians of these legal and illegitimate elections, would only, only deepen the, the escalation and would only deepen the persecution of these people and repressions against these people. Because uh, the aim of Russia is to actually deportate the, the Crimean Tatars again, and, uh, and, and what, it's already the hybrid deportation, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the repressions would only deepen. Right. Um, and what, uh, what other things, so we talked a bit more about uh, Crimea at this point, what are some of the things they're looking at specifically to help some of the political prisoners? Indeed, uh, we were extremely worried about the fate of our political prisoners. There are more than 22 political prisoners in the Russian Federation and more than 60, uh, I'm sorry, 40 uh, prisoners uh, at least in the occupied Crimea, totally more than 60. But the figure itself is not exhausting because we understand that every day people are being killed or have been tortured or have been detained, illegally detained, mm -hmm. illegally arrested. So. What we are doing right now, there are three tracks. One is legal. We're trying to testify and to give all evidence to international courts. You know that Ukraine has launched uh, different legal proceedings against yeah. Russia. Secondly, information war. In, Russia has waged a huge information propaganda and disinformation, but we try to rebut that. And we try to uh, inform all our partners to keep high on the agenda, to know the names of our political prisoners, to ask our diplomatic um, diplomatic and uh, council officers of different countries to attend the hearings to see themselves how Russia behaves at this uh, illegal hearing so called because all these people are being detained or arrested or sentenced on fabricated political charges and the third track is obviously we definitely cooperate very actively with human rights organizations in Ukraine and outside and it is extremely important to hear the voice of the society that we support uh, they support our people and I think in its synergy, it helps. All right. And let's talk just one second about, uh, specifically about Oleg Sintsov. Yes. Uh, what is the situation now? We, we learned recently that he was uh, considering asking for clemency to be released. Um, he's been in prison in solitary confinement for some time now after being handed this 20-year uh, sentence. Is there any progress being made on his case? Well, there has been a lot of speculation recently on Oleg Sintsov, which are not yet confirmed. Mm. Uh, firstly, uh, Ukraine uh, hasn't had any access of our Ukrainian consul to Oleg Sintsov since four years of his illegal detention and sentencing. So we were denied on the grounds that he's a Russian citizen, though mm. Oleg Sintsov never uh, was deprived of Ukrainian citizenship, never asked for Russian citizenship. He is a Ukrainian citizen, but 
we were never granted an access to our council. So this is number one. Number two is that we constantly write notes of protest, not verbalers, different notes to the Russian Federation requesting, urging to grant this success. He has access to the lawyers and uh, he can sp speak and write to his sister and we get information basically from them, but not from mm -hmm. the Russian authority, mm -hmm. um, which gravely violates international law and not from him himself. His health deteriorated recently, mm -hmm. but uh, we don't know in what conditions he is right now at this stage. So yesterday, in view of the reports that he his health has deteriorated, we sent immediately not verbal to the Russian Federation requesting that we need to have access to Oleg. We need to see him. We need to know what conditions he is in. And if necessary, we need to call for doctors, Ukrainian doctors or international doctors to visit him to grant help. But the ultimate aim is, of course, to release all our political prisoners. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what kind of takeaway should we, what should we look, be looking forward to from Ukraine and from the Ministry of international affairs in the next, uh, the foreign affairs in the next few months. In terms of Crimea? In terms of Crimea, in terms of, in general, uh, the, the emphasis we're going to see, perhaps some upcoming meetings and, and the plans for this near future. Well, obviously, this is... Uh countering Russian aggression. We will definitely work in line with the Minsk agreements. We're definitely committed because they are the basis for settlement of the uh, war in Donbas waged by the Russian Federation. Obviously, we are totally committed to work in the Normandy format and in the trilateral contact group. Uh, but it all depends on Russia, on its political will, whether it wants to, to, to work and to, to, to see Ukraine uh, definitely sovereign and prosperous. No, obviously, Russia is not interested in successful Ukraine. Russia is interested in destabilizing, Russia is interested in the war, Russia is interested that Ukraine either doesn't exist or is very destabilized and chaotic. Mm -hmm. This is obvious. Secondly, we will definitely work more closely with EU in terms of implementation of the tra free trade agreement and EU association agreement. We will definitely work closely with NATO and we are preparing for the EU-NATO summit in, uh, in July and uh, definitely we will try to work more harder and more effectively in terms of protection of our people abroad, because this is also the priority, not only the political prisoners, but also ordinary citizens who need our support. And this is always our, our line. The Minister of Foreign Affairs is op always open to all people who need our assistance, Ukrainian citizens abroad. Okay. Thank you so much for being with us Welcome. today. Welcome. Welcome. Today we were joined by Mariana Betsa, spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. Thank you for watching.